Please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, help us this day to understand and celebrate your dream for the world, to be transformed in Jesus' love, and to use our gifts to make a difference for others. Amen. I won't say that I know just how Jesus felt on that day when he went into the temple, but I have some inkling. A few years ago, I too went to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage. I went hoping to experience the places where Jesus lived and to understand and or to help me understand better my own faith and what it meant in the context of where all that stuff actually happened. I went also because I wanted to experience the reality and the power of God in that holy land. I imagine spending time there in those holy places, soaking in the power of the Holy Spirit. I was especially looking forward to visiting the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The church is built over the place where Jesus was crucified and laid in the tomb, and little uh, outcroppings of those very places remain, even though they're covered over by a lot of ornamental church stuff. For centuries, this one place has been the holiest place in all of Christendom. And so, on the day we arrived in Jerusalem, we traveled along the Via Della Rosa, the path, the traditional path that Jesus walked from his trial to his crucifixion. And at the end of that path, we turned a corner and walked into the back of the church that holy moment where I was showing up at that holy place. But instead, the place was packed. There was noise. There was clutter of centuries of devotional accoutrements piled on top of that space. It was still amazing to be there. Don't get me wrong, but there were long lines near the tomb and near Golgotha, the crucifixion spot, and people were yakking and chatting to each other. And so I was disappointed that this holy place I had come to experience had so many distractions. So I have a sense of what Jesus may have been experiencing in a small way that day as he went to the temple for the sacred feast of Passover. Thousands of pilgrims coming to make animal sacrifices. A whole industry set up to help those who had traveled from long distances purchase animals and make offerings. All packed into a fairly small space. And all the activity drowning out the presence of God, who, as we remember, speaks in a still, small voice. It's no wonder Jesus wanted to drive out all the noise and the clutter so that he, and indeed everybody who else came, could find an encounter with God. But this story is more than about finding a quiet place to pray. It's about how a relationship with God gets cluttered up by things both profane and sacred. Consider our first line of the reading from the Hebrew Scripture today. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. This is similar to other covenant sayings, like when Abraham makes, or when God makes a promise to Abraham, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. Or in another place, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. 
your reward shall be very great. Or sometimes we hear that word of God in the prophets. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But to those who wait for the Lord, he shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Each of these lines of scripture is a call for the people to place their whole trust in the one who created the world, who delivers, from, who delivers them from the things that imprison and bind them, to understand that this God is the God who promises blessings for you and through you for the whole world. I am the one who saves you. I am the one who is with you, says the Lord. I am the one who will bring you to life. And in the Ten Commandments today, only after reminding the people of God's saving power do the commandments lay out what it means to walk in whole relationship with God. It's telling that the first four commandments are all about idolatry and making space for God. You see, we humans have a tendency to forget that it is God that promises life. Faithful people easily fall into the trap of idolatry, which is counting on things that we devise and create to give us meaning or a sense of security or even to define our own worth and the worth of others. And the idols are many. Reputation, stuff, and money. Being from the right family or race. Education. Being attractive in the eyes of others. You can probably identify your own idols if you stop and think for a minute. And it's not that anything is necessarily, any of these things are necessarily bad in and of themselves. Indeed, sometimes these things are icons of the greatness and the wonder of God. But the danger is they become the first thing we think about in the morning and the last thing we think about at night. And they will so clutter our souls that they'll, for, they'll cause us to forget that the first thing is that God is at work liberating and leading and strengthening and healing. And so, when Jesus goes into that cluttered temple, it's not just that it's busy or that what the people are doing is somehow bad in itself. The danger is all this buying and selling, and maybe even the holy sacrifices themselves, have become the main reason these people are going to the temple. Carrying out some practice to get on God's good side, while forgetting that God's very nature is to liberate and to heal and to pour out abundant blessings. And that same kind of clutter can extend to daily life as well. I wonder what the first thing you think about is when you wake up in the morning or the last thing at night or what creeps into your thoughts throughout the day repeatedly. What is it? that's cluttering your mind and your soul. That's why we have a practice this Lent here at St. Paul's to stop 
and to take the time to examine our days so that we can remember God. So at the end of the day, or at the beginning, or any time really, we stop and walk the way of the examine. So I'd like to do that right now for just a moment together and give us that chance, wherever you are in your holy space, to let God come in through all the clutter. We begin by giving thanks. Take a moment and give thanks for those places where you have particularly known God's grace. Where have you seen God revealed in creation? Or in the loving presence of another person? Or in something you have read? Or in a surprising moment of peace? Invite the Holy Spirit in. Come, Holy Spirit, shine through the clutter and help me see, to see you, to see where you have been moving in my life and in the lives of others. Breathe into all of my life with your truth and grace. And now, take a moment to rest in God. The God who created all that is. The God who longs to be in relationship with you. The God who desires to set you free from all that draws you from life. The God who is coming to meet you, take a moment to rest in God. And now, ask God to set you free from the things that are keeping you from a life fully lived in trust. On this day, when we remember and celebrate decluttering, name the many idols that have captured your attention and your trust. Call to mind the things and attributes that promise to keep you safe or give you life, but in trusting in them, they draw you away from the God of life. Ask forgiveness for your forgetfulness and determine to put lesser things in their proper place. And finally, look ahead with hopefulness and a renewed trust in God's intentions for you and for our world. Not a world that you will create on your own, but the hope of a day infused with the power of God's spirit of love. We can practice decluttering our souls and lives each day when we remember to start and end with God's promises and God's grace. And we can remember that what we count on to bring us life can often be the very things that keep us from truly living. 
but we can look for that decluttered space that leads to a decluttered life where God can fill each day with what truly makes life worth living.